Jason, welcome back to the program. It's been a while since we've talked. In fact, I, I'm pretty sure we haven't had any climate scientists on since COP26. And uh, I would love to do a, a kind of a recap with you about what's going on in, on the planet. And, and, and you know, I think we all know how disastrous uh, COP was. Uh, but welcome back. And, and what are your thoughts? Where are we at right now? Well, one of the things we looked at was the COPS 26 scenario in terms of sea level rise. And unfortunately, the expected sea rise on the commitments made at COP26 is well above uh, the kinds of scenarios that, that uh, planners appear to be working with. Uh, there seems to be a, a filter that we're not getting through to politicians and even coastal planners that we need to prepare for massive and expensive sea rise on the medium to longer term. Medium to longer term meaning what? Uh, 30 years, 50 years, well, 100 years? Well, it's already becoming a nuisance and an expensive problem in like Florida where the bedrock is porous and there's nothing, you, can, you can't build walls. Uh, but I think about a lot more immediate problems with climate than sea rise. Uh, problems of the loss of food and water security that are connected to the warming in the Arctic, which we're finding is happening more than three times as fast as the globe. And the rate that the Arctic is warming is actually increasingly outpacing global warming. So I just found out that we're looking, we punched above 4x global uh, in, in, if you measure from 2005 forward. So how you measure Arctic amplification depends on, you know, the, the, the time period that you're looking at. Uh, we noticed that there was a big bump up of Arctic warming after 2005. And a number of studies are pinning that on an increase in uh, winter warm events. Uh, so we know what's happening in the Arctic and it is connected with the rest of the world. Jason, there was a, a piece in the New York Times last week uh, where they made a map of North America and they showed with red dots where there were unusual heat events last year in 2021 and it with blue dots where there were un unusual cold events. And it was fascinating because the unusual heat events, I mean, here in Portland, Oregon, where I live, we had 116 degree temperatures Fahrenheit for three days in a row. It was insane it was never, never before be seen. Uh, people dying up and down the West Coast, um, and then of course forest fires and things like that. So the whole West Coast had all these bright red dots, particularly the Northwest. And then the blue dots were all across the central United States on the east side of the Rockies, uh, particularly down into Texas where, you know, we got freezing temperatures um, that sent, sent Ted Cruz fleeing to Cancun. Um, and it looked to me like one of those almost like the meteorological patterns where you see the Gulf Stream when the Gulf Stream kind of f collapses and just drools down the, the east side of the Rockies, you know, and it, and it stalls out west of the Rockies and drools down, way down east of the Rockies and allows Arctic air to come down behind it. Um, is, is that what I was seeing? Are we watching in real time as the jet stream is weakening and possibly collapsing? And if so, what, what would the outcome of that be? Yeah, I call that a signature of Arctic climate change. That is precisely the connection of the Arctic warming faster than the rest of the globe. It's resulting in more stationary wave patterns in the atmosphere. And we started to see those, uh, I remember 2010, 11, 12, the Eastern US was in a kind of an ice age while the Western US was high and dry. And that pattern seems to be uh, more recurrent, the the deep excursions of the the jet stream that that brought the uh, record cold to Texas. The these surprising events are not that surprising when you study the 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 number of waves that that occur in the in this the, this planetary vortex. The the fact is it, the wave numbers are increasing or the, the stationarity of those patterns is increasing. And that's when we get not only uh, hot and cold, but, but extremes of wet and dry. 
So as, as one of the world's leading climate scientists, Dr. Jason Box, um, uh, how, how do you see this playing out? I mean, it, you mentioned sea level rise is going to get more radical as we, as we come along. We're seeing people being wiped out, you know, tornadoes, my, uh, derechos, something I uh, part, wasn't even part of my vocabulary until last year. Uh, you know, a mile wide tornadoes uh, going across the Midwest. Um, yeah, how much, how rapidly is this going to continue to intensify? Or has it hit a plateau that it'll probably stay at for a few years or a while? And if it does intensify, these, these kinds of extreme weather events, whether it's 116 degree summers in Portland or, or um, you know, uh, minus 10 degree, uh, you know, winters in, on the Mexican border, uh, how do, how does that how does it how does it play out? I mean, what should we be expecting? How how bad is it going to get, and how quickly is it going to get that bad? Unfortunately, the baseline keeps shifting, so I don't think that we're reaching any plateaus. Uh, this concept of the new normal is uh, a distraction from the transient changes that are happening. Uh, we're, we're, it's not a new normal. The, that obscures the fact that we continue trending out of uh, a stable climate. And we, um, we, what we need to do is reduce carbon emissions and get into pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. It's an enormous, colossal project. But, but the, even just getting started on that starts to put the brakes on this catastrophe. And, you know, that, that really should be uh, one of the central organizing principles of governments and, and around the world. Because we need the high-level policy. The, the individuals can only do so much. And, and as someone else put it, you know, short showers aren't going to get us there. We need really strong policy. And, and I would argue to uh, redirect the militaries of the world to planting forests and and, uh, you know, safeguarding from it, it, the destruction of, of ecosystems. There, there, there are things that we can do about this. Uh, we, we need to really get into it. You and I had a conversation a couple of years ago about the consequences of large quantities of methane being mobilized, whether it's uh, methane clathrates frozen around the sea coasts of uh, all of our continents, around the coastal lines of all of our continents, or whether it's uh, peat and uh, you know uh, northern forests that have been frozen since the last ice age. Uh, any updates on that? Where are we at? Should, is this still a concern, or was that uh, at that the time that that we were discussing that a few years ago? Were we being overwrought? Well, it's come more into focus. Our um, abrupt permafrost processes. Uh, it's easy enough to measure uh, gradual changes in permafrost temperature. Uh, the borehole temperature records, uh, they, they do in indicate uh, a clear pattern of warming, but it's these abrupt processes that there are, is an increasing number of examples. Uh, for example, when water floods permafrost, you can get uh, so-called thermokarst uh, features. These are like uh, landslides. In, on a flat surface, they, they, they are a, a, an opening up of, of the tundra. So it, the, the concern about the methane release from the land and also the ocean hasn't uh, gone away. Well, the, the, the ocean still remains a, a big, scary wild card, but the land is clearly indicating uh, it, it's coming in, into, it's a more dynamic uh, permafrost. That's one fifth of the land surface of, of planet Earth is is permafrost, and it has uh, hundreds of gigatons of, of of carbon in it. So, as I've said in the past, you know, even if a small fraction of this stuff comes out, we're in deep doo doo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you uh, were you at COP twenty six, or did you just watch it from the sidelines like most of us did? Yeah, I, I did go, and I, I fell into this trap of, you know, I was expecting more out of it, mm -hmm. and uh, I really was, you know, because the, 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 the pressure had never been higher, the, the rhetoric was, was all there, um, but there wasn't much substance. There wasn't really any substance. It, it was hollow. Uh, so it was really disappointing, and, and for all of the young people that, that you know, 
have, have been having an impact from this youth-led Fridays for Future movement, they, I, I think, you know, they learn from that that uh, they they they're they're unable to count on on that kind of class of leadership. Yeah. Uh, the the leadership that we seem to need, or evidently, it has to come from somewhere else. And uh, yeah, the the youth led movement is uh, one source of hope. Yeah, I think you know the Sunrise Movement and the and the groups associated with it, the the Greta Thunbergs of the world. Are, are, are driving this, frankly. Uh, the, the, these old neoliberal politicians are just uh, flailing. We, we, we have about 45 seconds left. Dr. Jason Box, uh, where would you encourage people to focus their activism? Uh, we need leaders that take the threat more seriously than the ones that we have. Uh, the denialism that we see even uh, I, I, among the Democrats in the U.S. is uh, really alarming. The how to get true to Republicans, I think they need to understand what truly is at risk. They appear to be in a, in a fantasy or, or a very cynical uh, uh, political uh, corner that, um, that they, they, they don't seem to realize uh, really what's at stake here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, politics actually is what it comes down to. Dr. Jason Box, professor of glaciology at the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland, coming into us live from Europe. The author of a, a new book, Faster Than Forecast. Keep an eye out for this. Uh, we'll get you back on when, it, when it's out. Jason Box, Climate over on YouTube and Climate underscore Ice on Twitter. Jason, thanks for dropping by. Great having you with us.